Okay, so welcome everybody. Again, my name is Stephanie Wells at MIFA, and MIFA is a nonprofit quasi state authority here in Massachusetts. Uh, we've been working with schools and colleges and universities since 1982. And our presenter today, Amy Chenette from DCF, is going to be providing you with lots of great information about uh, foster youth and higher education. So, Amy, if you want to put that in slideshow mode, there we go. I'll just let Amy get in slideshow mode. Yeah, it kicked me off slideshow mode when you did the recording. Oh, okay. Um, if you want to make it bigger, maybe. Yeah. Make the screen bigger. And do you want, if you want, I can do the slides too, if that works better for you. Yeah, it just won't kick, it won't. Um... Okay, so that should be that should be okay and we'll share the slides so hopefully everybody can see the slides I can read them pretty well um, from here so let's just do it that way and we can you can um, just go from one slide to the next I think that'll work just fine. Uh, so thank you for that. Okay, well I'm going to turn over to Amy I'm going to let her introduce herself tell her a little bit about um, their program over at DCF and what they do. And she is going to go through the presentation and feel free again to put your questions in the Q&A feature and we will um, answer those as we go. So I'm gonna put myself on mute and turn it over to you, Amy. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time to help with this important webinar. No problem, thanks, Stephanie. Hi, I'm Amy Chanette. I am the program specialist in the Adolescent and Young Adult Services Unit at the Department of Children and Families. Um, I've been with DCF for quite some time. I'm going on 18 years. You don't hear that very often anymore. Um, I was previously an ongoing worker, then an adolescent outreach worker, and just took on my new role as a program specialist. Um, so today, we are gonna be talking about some of the services for post-secondary for our foster youth, um, and specifically kind of what the Adolescent and Young Adult Services Unit can assist with um, and work collaboratively with guidance counselors with our youth that are looking at higher education. Thanks, Amy. And I just made you the co-host. If you just try one more time, yeah. see if you can put it in slideshow mode, and if it doesn't work, then we'll just keep, the way, keep it the way it is. Maybe that gives you uh, more power to do <laughs> do stuff. Not working? Okay, we'll just stick with the session, the way, the program that we have. Yeah, that works. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Unless the, oh, I got it. Okay. So today we're going to talk about post-secondary preparation for foster youth, the FAFSA for our youth, documentation requirements for our youth, DCF education programs, including the tuition waiver, foster child grant, education and training voucher, the William Warren scholarship, DCF adolescent and young adult support services, and kind of a sample on-campus support network that we use to um, on each of the college campuses to try to connect our young people to supports on campus. Um, for our young people before senior year, uh, we have a youth readiness support tool and we kind of use that. It's a, it's a little assessment that identifies short-term and long-term goals for young people, as well as kind of um, deficits or um, surpluses of life skills and kind of where we need to get them um, as they're going off, turning 18, entering a post-secondary program Kind of what they need to work on before they get there. Um, we like to continue to identify student support systems. So a lot of times with our young people before senior year, we're asking who their guidance counselor is, you know, who is a significant person at school, because a lot of our youth use um, obviously guidance and other teachers and support staff at high schools um, to assist them because they really don't have sometimes people at home to help them uh, with the college process. And some of the work we do with our youth is PIA, which is um, preparing adolescents for young adulthood. And that's really the life skill work, you know, things like 
getting your driver's license, making sure you have your birth certificate, your social security card. Um, you know, do you know how to do laundry? Do you know what a lease is? Kind of some of the basic stuff that we are probably taught by our parents or, um, and our foster youth sometimes don't have um, someone who can teach them those skills. So the adolescent services unit has outreach workers for each office that generally work with youth on those skills. And then post-secondary messages and expectations. Um, a lot of our work with young people um, is kind of hearsay. Our young people will say like, oh, I can't go to college. Like I won't have enough money or I don't know if I'm smart enough. These are a lot of the messages that our foster youth get. So we like to tease out kind of some of the rumors, you know, some of the urban myths with these young people. We have, um, you know, kids everywhere. We have kids on the East Coast, the West Coast. We don't have anybody international yet, but um, they can go to school in any state. Uh, there's a lot of myths out there and a lot of the youth, um, our youth struggle to uh, overcome what they think is it, like, like a mountain to climb. Like, oh, well, there's so much for college. I'm not sure I can actually do that. Um, but between myself, ongoing workers, there's a lot of support from us. It's sometimes people don't realize that uh, they have this amount of support. Um, SATs and pre-SATs, I know you guys as guidance counselors are big, big help in this um, with the SAT waivers and the pre-SAT waivers. Um, I'm pretty sure, and someone can correct me in the Q&A that uh, they only get one waiver. I think they might've upped it up to two. We do have the ability if they've exhausted their waivers and they're just really struggling with test taking and they feel like they wanna take it again. We do have the ability through some funding to pay for an SAT or a pre-SAT uh, class. So I just wanted to let people know that. Um, a lot of the discussions with our young people are the social emotional needs that they have. So, you know, if we have a young person that may be struggling with their mental health, you know, going out to school in California, even though they, you know, they may be very bright and have a 4.0 and academically, we have no concerns for them going to school there. Uh, they lose a big part of their support system. And that, that's the success for our foster youth is their support system in school. Um, a lot of trauma can come up for our young people that first year of school, um, and they struggle with things that maybe other students don't struggle with, like roommate situations become gigantic versus somebody else might shrug it off. Um, they feel really isolated. That's why we try to connect them to campus. So really starting to talk about that stuff their senior year before they get on campus to talk about kind of their fears and maybe something that they may not um, have thought of could come up at school. Um, we also talk a lot about academic standing. A lot of our young people um, don't think that they're quote unquote college material based on their GPA. Um, and as guidance counselors, I know you guys are promoting these guys like you can do it. Um, you know, we try to encourage anybody to go and, and pursue post-secondary. That's, that's the success uh, that leads to success for our young people. Um, and a lot of times people feel like the GPA um, determines where you're going to go. And I know you guys know this as you get all of the young people um, in your high schools where they end up. Uh, but for our youth, there's a lot of factors that play in. So for instance, um, you know, their resiliency, uh, you know, their essays. I've had a lot of young people um, get personal notes. I mean, handwritten notes back from admissions talking about, you know, this essay really made it for me. Like, I really want to admit you to my school. And these are kids that had GPAs that I was pretty realistic saying, you're probably not going to get into the school. It's a reach school. Um, but I also encourage them to pursue their dreams. Now I'm not encouraging people to apply to Harvard. Um, you know, if they have a 144, we try to talk that out, but, um, I do tend to try to encourage people to do some reach schools because you just never know. Um, and especially in COVID, what I've been seeing is that kind of some of the traditional GPA requirements uh, have been blown out the window. So um, affordability, I talked a little bit about our young people are what's considered independent students. So they can't take out private loans. Um, so really what they get from the FAFSA and some additional DCF funding is kind of all they have um, to go to school. And that means either the school makes up the deficit or they choose a university or college that 
uh, is within their financial means. Not to say that they can't uh, go to a school that, you know, maybe is a little bit more costly. Some young people have um, gone to schools where there's a cost, you know, an out-of-pocket cost. And, you know, we have a lot of talks about that that puts a lot of young, a lot of pressure on young people. But I do have a disclaimer. I did have a young person who wanted to get a bachelor's degree in welding, um, didn't know that you could do that. Uh, she taught me a lot. She went to UPenn and she had a $15,000 cash balance every year. And every year she worked during the summer, then worked during the school year. Um, and she paid that cash balance every year, even though it was stressful. She graduated with a bachelor's in welding from uh, UPenn. And she said, please tell everyone that story that you can do it. Now that's a, a big overachiever, but you know, there are ways to do it if you have a really motivated kid. And then vocational versus college. We do a lot of career assessments with the young people. Is college for you? Maybe you wanna look at a vocation. Maybe you wanna look at both, do some concurrent planning. Um, the, the next part, the DCF intranet adolescent services page, that's specific to our agency. So um, at the end, the MassGov website is listed. So you can find all of our college information on that. But um, the DCF intranet is something that you could, if you're talking to an ongoing social worker and you said, hey, I heard this DCF benefits for youth that are going to college. Um, they said that it was on the DCF intranet. Any social worker can access that and see the benefits that youth are eligible for. Um, for all our young people on campus, go, going off to school to be on a campus, they have to complete a FAFSA. Um, it has to be completed for our youth. The only time a youth can't complete a FAFSA and they wouldn't be eligible for a FAFSA is usually if they are not a US citizen or a documented, um, I'm gonna blank on the word. Um, if they don't have some kind of documentation that allows them to do so. Um, for our young people, uh, they don't have anyone, the deadlines are even more important for foster youth. So a lot of times, especially if a youth is in a program or a foster parent who hasn't been through school or they're not really connected to their foster parent, they don't know that there are deadlines for things every year on April, whatever the last day of April is, we get tons of calls. I didn't know the FAFSA was due May 1st. I didn't even know I had to do a FAFSA. So reminding of our young people is super helpful and super important um, to let them know when deadlines are. A lot of times, you know, in our work, we're like, okay, when is this college application due? Okay, do you want to do early action? Then that means December 1 is our, is our deadline. January 1 is our other deadline. Constantly reminding them because um, there's there's no one else doing that. Um, so we, we like to take advantage of existing resources. Um, like I said, there's adolescent outreach workers in each office. Um, and those are kind of the workers that that are um, trained and specialized in post-secondary education and can get the resources that the kids need. Um, at the end of the slideshow, there will be a list of supervisors. So if you have, depending on where you are in the state, you can always call one of those supervisors. Hey, I have a young person, haven't heard back from their social worker, want to connect them. They're looking at going to school. They can, they can navigate you to the right person. Obviously, we have MIFA as a resource. And then FAFSA Day Massachusetts, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, um, but we do send some young people to FAFSA Day um, if they can't, can't connect with us. Um, on the FAFSA, the three most important thing for our youth is they should either be checking, I was a dependent or ward of the court since turning age 13. I was in foster care since turning age 13, or I am currently, or I was in a legal guardianship. Um, so our youth um, generally are checking, I was a dependent or ward of the court since turning age 13. So th that's the youth that tend to be on the older end, staying with the department post 18. We do have some youth that maybe were in care after 13, maybe they were in care from 14 through 17. They also get are allowed to check off I was in foster care and then I'm currently or was in a legal guardianship. So guardianship um, 
is basically reverts them back to an independent student because it doesn't go against the finances of the guardian. So um, all of those would make our young people an independent student, which means they get the maximum amount of aid. Um, so answering yes to any of those, you either had no parent, no living parent, even if you're now adopted, you were in foster care, even if you weren't in foster care today, you are a dependent or ward of the court, even if you are no longer a dependent or ward of the court today. Um, so essentially our youth that stay um, have been in care after 13 and stay until 18 and beyond are, are kind of ward of the courts. Um, once they get to the end of the FAFSA, this is gonna pre-populate for them. The question is, are you a youth are you a foster youth or were you at any time in the foster care system? So the youth are checking yes. It automatically pre-populates this, that you are eligible for ATV funding, which will lead to a conversation about our other funding. And then when they click on the state ETV coordinator, it will kick it right to our Massachusetts um, Adolescent Services page and they will have a person to contact if they're not in touch with DCF anymore. Um, so what we can assist with, we can assist with proof of custody status. So a lot of times schools will want to know um, are in the custody of the department, who has custody, who's, who's the legal guardian. We can write the ward of the court letter, which basically says that they were in care and ended care at age 18. Anybody who works with the department post 18 is a voluntary. Um, guardianship proof from DCF or probate. So we have, we have DCF sponsored guardianships that, that go until 18 and then can be extended through their post-secondary career. Um, probate's a little bit more tricky um, and will take us some more time. So if you have somebody who's guardian through probate, um, that's a little bit more of a process. So you wanna start early on that and, and maybe asking the young people, oh, you're in a guardianship, like, is it through DCF? How, how, did, you, how did you end up with this guardian? Um, almost all of our students get flagged for verification. So when they get when they get their offers from the schools and their financial aid packages and they accept, they are going to get they have to verify their income. And if they can't provide W twos or they can't link, they haven't filed taxes, which a lot of our young people do not file taxes. Um, they cannot link to the IRS site. So you have to provide your W-2s and remember the FAFSA is dated two years back. So from the previous two years, this creates an obstacle, especially in COVID and, and even when it's not COVID time where you have to get a non-tax filer verification, which means an appointment for the IRS when the IRS is open. In COVID times, the IRS has not been open. So you have to um, apply for that online. Now, if you don't have the correct address, the IRS will continuously just reject it. Our young people move around a lot. They may not, they may not remember where they filed tax, where they they filed taxes or or a guardian claimed them what address that was, which will then prompt you to um, get booted from the IRS system and then they try to say it's fraud. So please don't keep entering addresses by the young people. Um, colleges have been waiving this during COVID. So I don't know what will happen next year, but if you have someone that can't prove their taxes, they should, you know, January, February, start working on the non-filer verification and either schedule an appointment with the IRS or figure out the online tool or contact um, an IRS representative. They are able to do some stuff, some verification through fax so um, that's helpful if they're in your office and you can stand in front of a fax machine, they can send over a copy of their ID and verify that it's them. Um, obviously immigration citizen status, um, they need to be US citizens or have some kind of immigration status. Um, and they, they're gonna have to verify that. They have to upload their green card um, to the, the Common App um, and to FAFSA. So um, you wanna be aware of that. Um, the DCF educational programs that we offer, we offer foster child grant, I mean, um, foster child tuition and fee waiver, adopted child tuition and fee waiver, the Massachusetts foster child grant, the Massachusetts education and training voucher, and the William Warren scholarship. Um, the tuition and fee waiver can be used at any state university 
or college or community college. Um, so that's all the UMasses, all your Framingham, Framingham, Salem, Worcester, and then for instance, your Bunker Hill, your Middlesex, your Cape Cod Community College, all of which the tuition and fee waiver will apply. And for youth to be eligible for that, they need to be in DCF custody until age 18. They were unable to return home. They have not reached their 25th birthday. They were adopted or they were guardianed. Um, that form is on our uh, on our adolescent services page. Any young person can access that at MassGov. Um, and it's just a one page form and you provide a copy of your birth certificate. Uh, the Ma Massachusetts Foster Child Grant, the eligible youth for that must be permanent legal residents of Massachusetts, US citizen or non-citizen eligible under title feet Title or regs, which gets very confusing. So if you do have somebody who's a non-citizen or not a US citizen, might be good to connect early to kind of see what they do qualify for. Uh, if they were in DCF protective custody, so um, they can't be involuntary. Sometimes we will have young people, especially with school systems that are in a residential placement. It doesn't happen so much, but in my 20 years, I have seen a few where um, they take a voluntary placement agreement from the parent and there's a cost share between the school and the um, department, those youth are not going to qualify for a foster child grant um, because they were voluntarily placed there and the parents still retain legal and physical custody of the young person. Um, they haven't reached their 21st birthday. They're enrolled full time. So for this, you have to be enrolled in 12 credits and you meet the school's requirements for satisfactory academic progress. So if someone falls below a 2.0, uh, they wouldn't be necessarily eligible for it for the following year. Uh, education and training voucher, youth who are in DC cu DCF custody until the age of 18. They were unable to return home. They have not reached their 26th birthday. They're adopted or guardian after age 16. Um, and they must have a high school diploma or GED to be eligible. William Warren Scholarship is Youth have to be in DCF care or custody in the past, um, in the past for a minimum of one year. They cannot have reached their 25th birthday. They're enrolled in post-secondary Title IV eligible program. Applicants must demonstrate significant unmet financial need. So, for instance, I gave you the example of the young lady at Penn State. Um, she could, quali she could qualify for a William Warren scholarship as she has unmet need. So um, she did get a little bit from this, but this isn't a large amount of money. This is to make up small deficits, usually, you know, probably 5,000 and under. Um, so that's something if the youth have a deficit that they can access. Uh, this is a, these are the services that um, my division offers within the department. We have PIA, which we talked about, which is life skill training. Uh, for young people, some of the things are, you know, um, personal care, job maintenance, money management, healthy relationships, housing, kind of everything you need to know to kind of go out into the world. Emerging Futures is an internship program we have for young people where they can be paid to explore, kind of do some career ex exploration. We've had people work at, you know, a bank. We've had people work at town hall thinking about politics. Um, we've had some people work on a job site, you know, just observing as a plumber. Um, so we're really creative with that. Whatever is going to give that young person kind of an idea or some valuable work experience, that's something that we can pay them for. Life skill support program is kind of our funding source. We have different funding than the ongoing social worker would, and it can be used towards independent living skills. So for instance, bus passes, athletic uniforms, sports fees, senior class expenses, all of those things that you need in high school that usually a parent will be paying for. Um, our division can um, fund those things. The one thing that I will say is, um, the sooner you can get that information and the, give it to the youth so that the youth can submit for that funding, it takes about six to eight weeks to get that funding. Um, so it's a little bit of a process. And a lot of times, you know, they need their senior dues and it's like, they're not gonna graduate without them, but they told us two weeks ago. So we don't have any immediate funding source where we can just be like, hey, here, here's the money. So the, um, the, more, the, the earlier, the better. Um, the WAVE is our youth-driven uh, newsletter that's written by the youth. Um, 
So we have art in there, we have recipes, we have stories from youth, we have um, post-secondary information, vocational information, um, and that usually comes out quarterly. We have joint youth advisory committees. Um, there's five regions and we have five regional advisory boards where youth come together with staff um, to work on issues that are going on with, within the department. It might be uh, a new policy that came out that affects you know, our older youth. It might be struggles that they have in post-secondary. It's really driven by them and kind of what they want to accomplish and what they want to do. Um, you know, they often meet with high level management to, to kind of express their ideas. Um, they sit on committees. Uh, so it's a really important part of our work to kind of promote leadership uh, within our youth. Um, our discharge support system, if you, if you know a youth that's leaving after age 18 and doesn't want to sign in with the department, I'm sure you've all come across someone who you think, please stay with the department, but they say, I don't want to. Um, we have the ability to give them a little bit of funding towards housing related needs. So first, last and security, just depending on where you live in the state, you won't get the whole thing, but you'll get, get a chunk of it. Um, you know, if they were already living independently, maybe to catch up on utilities or um, anything really related to kind of going out on their own. Um, and then we have the adolescent outreach program. So that's where I came from. I was an adolescent outreach worker. Again, when I first started, um, you know, I covered two offices and some people covered three offices. Now we have an adolescent outreach worker in every office. Um, and they kind of they are the experts in this post-secondary stuff. So a lot of times, you know, you might call an ongoing worker and they're like, geez, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I've never heard of that. Let me find out. I know there's some college funding. You know, they have cases, you know, kids who are 21 all the way down to new boards. So it's hard for them to retain this information unless they've really worked with adolescents long-term or kind of walked an adolescent through this process. So um, on the side here, you'll see the regional supervisors, depending on what region you're in, you can contact one of these supervisors. Hey, I have a young person. I need to get them some information. You want to connect them with the outreach worker. You know, who's the outreach worker that covers that office? Um, and they'll be happy to help you with anything uh, related to post-secondary. Obviously, our director is Michelle Banks. She supervises the program. Um, and then we have our two ETV workers. So our ETV workers are our education training specialists. So those, these are also other workers. They're at the end of the slideshow that you can contact that specifically just work with kids in post-secondary education or in a vocational training program. So they have all kinds of contacts on campus. Um, they have, uh, you know, the knowledge of what, what kids qualify for, they actually certify what kids qualify for. So you can also reach out to them as well if you have a specific question regarding um, the educational benefits. Um, this is a sample of what we try to give young people for on-campus supports. Our kids are constantly looking to replace. I know you guys are such a huge, important part of their lives in school. And oftentimes there'll be a teacher or, you know, a, a dean or whoever it may be that, that they really go to for guidance. And when they go off to school, they lose that. So we try to connect them to, to people that we think would be helpful. Um, Salem specifically has a student advocacy office. So Chris Sullivan is like wonderful. I mean, she just, she takes on anything, you know, oh, this kid's having a difficult time. Like, let me connect them to health services, counseling services. Not every school has that, but we try to have point people um, that we can connect you to. Hey, I know we're not there and you're looking for somebody to run some ideas by. Why don't you go down to so-and-so's office? They're, you know, you can tell them you were in foster care. You can tell them that you're in DCF. They'll keep it secret because um, a lot of our kids don't want to see, don't want to disclose that they're in DCF. So they're kind of embarrassed about it, especially when they get on campus. So we kind of do it as discreet as possible um, and connect them to people that we know will kind of support them, um, whatever the, the avenue is on campus, whether it's residence life. Like I said, a lot of our young people have roommate difficulties because they, they have a trust issue. You know, maybe they, they were in a program or a foster home and things happened with the roommates. So they kind of bring that to campus. So it's tough for them to navigate, especially a roommate situation. 
Um, so getting res life and the RA to kind of be like, hey, can we can we support this person? Maybe a room change, maybe just work it out between the two roommates. Um, the disability offices are super helpful, um, especially for our young people who most have IEPs um, and transitioning those IEPs to a college campus is really youth driven and our youth a lot of times don't advocate for themselves. So having them get all this information to the disabilities office, like their IEP, their testing, um, is kind of overwhelming to them. And then on top of that, they have to set the appointment at the disabilities office to get accommodations. So really working with them to make sure that they're connected, to make sure that um, they know what they, they have available to them on campus. Uh, whether or not they access those, those services is up to them, but really just trying to connect them with the disability services. Another little plug is, um, you know, and I'm sure if you have any other students with IEPs, you know, the testing has to be within the last three years. Um, so uh, they're getting a little bit more stringent on that. Um, and then updated IEP. So if you have young people that are accessing um, special ed services, just thinking about that as they get close to senior year, um, especially if they're gonna need their IEP on campus. Um, the DCF contact info. So Laurie Hernandez and, and Anna Torms are our ETV workers. And like I said, they are the go-to people for post-secondary education questions. Um, if you happen to still keep in touch with the student and they're reaching out to you, you can divert them to us. Um, Anna and Laurie have their own connections on campus for kids that are struggling at all the state schools. So whether it's mental health, financial aid, a bill, residence life, they have people they can connect the young person to immediately um, and kind of try to problem solve those situations. Um, they also certify. So if you had a question about a young person, you could always call them up and say, hey, this young person, they're not quite clear it, it, what kind of guardianship they were in or, you know, if if they qualify, they were in DCF, but now they're not. Um, they can they can um, determine their eligibility. The only thing is they're going to they're going to need a release um, beforehand. So just so you know that ahead of time. Um, so uh, grants and scholarship information that I talked about for, for uh, young people going off to school is on mass.gov uh, backslash DCF. Uh, all of our forms can be found there, foster child grant, ETV, tuition and fee waiver, William Warren, um, both in PDF, word form, young person can just download it, fill it out, the address where to send it is in there. You can also send any of those forms to Laurie or Anna as well. Um, so I think that is the end. Great. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but let me uh, just put that feeder out. If anybody has any questions, feel free to type those in right now before we end the webinar and um, be happy to answer those. So we'll give it another second. Um, while I'm letting, uh, giving folks a minute to type in their questions. Just wanna thank you, Amy, for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, again, this webinar was recorded, so we'll have it on our website and everybody will be able to, you know, watch the recording and get a PDP point throughout the year. So this is helpful for the folks who are on the line today, but also, you know, throughout the year, we'll be able to have this great uh, resource there. Okay, let me see, I think we have one question here. Um, let's see, are there certain forms that students have to fill out to access things? I'm not sure what things um, they're referring to, but maybe you can help out with that one. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you're asking is for the tuition waiver, the foster child grant, and the ETV and William Warren. Um, so there are forms for those. Um, they're on the MassGov website. They're basic one-page forms um, you know, just asking demographic information, like your name, your date of birth, where you live, where you're going to go to school. Um, and once you, once you apply for one of those, so say a young person applied for the tuition and fee waiver, but, you know, forgot about foster child grant and TV. They're kind of in our system now, and we ask for all the young people's email. So a mass email will go out and it will say, hey, you applied for the tuition and fee waiver, foster child grant, which 
is the only form that has a deadline, I should say that, which is July 1st every year. If a youth submits it on July 2nd, they go on the wait list. So it's the only form I say, please remember, like if you take anything, July 1st, something's due for DCF youth. Um, so that would, their email would get added to our list and they get a mass email like, hey, foster child grant is due July 1st. Like here it is in the email. Um, and then they also send out ETV. So they'll say ETV, you know, is available. We have the new form for this year and they go on this mass list. Senior year, your first freshman year, it's a lot of us gathering data. So they might not get those black kind of email blasts yet, but um, they will go on the list and they, and they will be kept up to date kind of when those forms are due. Great, thank you, Amy, that was super helpful. And, and thank you for, um, for posing that, that question, Casey, we appreciate it. Does anybody else have any other questions before we end the webinar for all? And again, I will be sending out a recording, link to a recording in this webinar to everybody who registered and it will live on our MIFA Institute site for PDP, um, for PDPs, if you wanna cash it in for one PDP point. Okay, I don't see anybody else typing in any Q&A. So I think we will end the webinar for today. And thank you again, Amy, for, for joining us. I know it was last minute. Um, Anna unfortunately had to um, had another uh, commitment. And so uh, Amy filled in last minute for us and we really appreciate that. So thank you again for, for helping today. It was great. This is great information. Great. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Amy. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you.